Um, welcome to the School of Design. And um, my name is Alan Pert, and I'm Deputy Dean here of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. Um, and a huge welcome to tonight's artist talk, which is called Ideas of Utopia, which is brought to us from London by Langlands and Bell. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here tonight on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people and I pay my respects to elders past and present and also acknowledge and respect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people had and still have laws that predate colonisation. And we join in their responsibility to care for country as built environment and design experts and thank the traditional owners for sharing their knowledge. Now, just a very brief context for this, every year, Critical and Curatorial Practices and in Design invites a series of artists and curators to present work which we feel is relevant to the theme um, of the subject. Now, there's some very obvious parallels with Langlands and Bell's most recent exhibition at Charleston, which includes a 40-year retrospective titled, titled Ideas of Utopia, and our theme this year, which is called Ideas of Subtopia. So clearly borrowing from um, Langlands and Bell, but we also borrow from Ian Nairn um, and his outrage articles in the Architectural Review from as far back as 1955. Importantly, the talk tonight is also in partnership with the Australian Centre for Architectural History, Urban and Cultural History, fondly known as ACAHUCH, to all of those in MSD, um, which uh, Philip is a co-chair and we're both members. Now, a bit of a personal journey. I first experienced Ben and Nikki's work back in 2004. I was aware of their work prior to that with Paddington Basin, but I first came in contact with the work in 2004 when I visited Mount Stewart on the island of Butte on the west coast of Scotland. Ben and Nikki had created what was meant to be a temporary work has now become permanent for the third Marcus of Butte, magical private chapel designed by William Burgess back in 1873, which in their words, reawakens this dormant private space and makes it accessible to the public for the very first time. Now, their mirrored floor interprets a myriad of hidden meanings as well as religious symbolism. And I've been patiently waiting for these last 18 years for the opportunity to engage in a broader conversation about their work, having tried to collect each and every exhibition catalog since. Um, and for interested parties, there is catalogues on the table for after the talk. You can take the time and reawakening is there. It's an amazing catalog with some fantastic essays in it. Now, importantly, in the context of the class and what we're teaching, Ben Langlands and Nikki Bell have long engaged with architecture in their work. They started including architectural models in their work around 1985 and have since been developing an artistic approach which questions the very foundations of architecture, essentially by way of the plan. So what these artists are seeking to express through their buildings, marked by history, factories, hospitals, prisons, schools, museums, religious buildings, is the similarity and significance of certain geometric figures, which determine the distribution of public spaces, whatever their use. The plan is indeed the expression of the imposition of a political, economic and cultural power, and often the expression of an ideology. There are common relations between architecture and furniture. We see this in the negotiating table from 91, between the buildings and its representation, which we see in the ministry, 2002, and between the rational design of the plan and its transformation into um, precious reliefs, which are the foundation of the oeuvre, which reconciles sculpture, painting, and architecture. And I think this is a really important thing that we can maybe tease out in the conversation, is this reconciliation between different modes of practice and architecture. So their practice and production extends to construction, which includes the glass steel pedestrian bridge in Paddington Station from 2002, it includes film and animation from the house of Osama bin Laden from 2003, as well as public sculpture, moving World Night and Day, which is at Heathrow Terminal from 2008. Now Ben, Langlands, and Nikki, um, Bell live and work in London, trained in fine arts at the Middlesex, Pol Middlesex Polytechnic College in London between 1977 and 80. They've been working together since 1978 and exhibiting since the early 1980s. I could go on and list the numerous exhibitions. There's too many, please look at the website. Um, but just some of them um, include major exhibitions at the Imperial War Museum, London, 2003, Whitechapel Art Gallery, 2006, MoMA, New York, 2006, 
And in 2004, they won the BAFTA Award for Interactive Arts Installation. And in the same year, they were nominated for the Turner Prize. So I feel tonight we are being provided with privileged access to their whole career and portfolio and to an amazing repository of works. So welcome, Ben and Nikki. Delighted to host you. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. very nice to be with you in Melbourne. <laughs> so we will start. So um, what we're going to look at is, as um, Alan has said, is a kind of um, a roughly chronological overview of the works we've made uh, since we started collaborating and working together in 1978. And um, but it's, it's not really strict chronology. And what we'll do is we'll let the images run and then we'll stop at certain points um, because there are a lot of them. Um, we'll stop at certain points to just elaborate and expand a little bit on what we're looking at. Um, but basically, uh, we we met in 1977, and we started um, we started collaborating in 1978. Well, I don't know why that's happened. Video. There we are. Ah, oh, there we are. So we moved to the East End um, in the late 70s and discovered incredible abandoned buildings, which became a source of inspiration for us. You could enter a lot of buildings which were totally ruined and kicked down doors and there were amazing objects and things that you could discover inside. Um, so even very personal items that had belonged to the original occupants were just, just left in place, clothing and, and personal uh, artifacts. and we became totally intrigued and absorbed uh, by the kind of um, atmospheres and stories that were really untold that kind of resided with these objects and these spaces and these buildings. Um, the East End of London at that time is very, very poor. It was pre-gentrification. And whereas other parts of London had been um, gentrified in waves over the throughout the 19th and 20th century. The East End um, of London at that point had not been gentrified really since the late 18th century. Um, so what we were looking at, we realized, was also a kind of social history that was suspended in a kind of state of su suspension. And we wanted to intervene with this and um, learn much more about it. So we started to recreate some of these environments. So we'll go back to the first work that we made together, which was called The Kitchen. Um, well, I don't know if I want to go back. Yes, I think we do, so that we can look at it. Hmm. No, this is not. So this was called The Kitchen and um, it was an installation in two halves and you can enter the old half which was full of time-worn rusty objects in cutlery trays, filthy wallpaper, rotten floorboards and the smell of gas being lit. And you could enter this environment and look through the window and there was almost a utopian vision through the membrane of the window of a brand new kitchen. It was a mirror image of the old one and the same kind of objects mirrored, but you could only stand in the past and look through the window at the future. So all, all the objects were very cheap items that we bought in bargain stores or pound shops or, or what have you. Um, Um, yeah, so we, our idea to start collaborating was just a, a spontaneous decision. It wasn't a kind of ideological program. We just decided to make one work together and we decided to make this uh, installation, the kitchen. Originally, the idea was that Nikki would make the old kitchen and I would make the new kitchen, but 
we just found it easier to carry on uh, working together, doing everything. And Is then we just, we didn't stop. We just carried on. It was more interesting to carry on working. This led us actually to make an exhibition um, of very everyday objects um, at Maureen Paley's Interim Art Gallery, which was a, a gallery in a house, which was quite unusual at the time. So people could walk off the street and discover a gallery inside her house. So we made a work called Traces of Living, which you saw earlier, um, which comprised of three tables and two chairs. Um, and they became vitrines with very everyday objects from the East End placed underneath the glass tops. And um, it was the first time we subverted the chair and decided to put a model in the seat of a chair. And the model was of the basement of the National Gallery. Basements are often used for storage. And um, so it seemed appropriate that we make a model of that. Um, so that was in 1986 was the first time we used an architectural model in an artwork. And this is really um, what we're looking at now is a, a piece called Museums in Motion, which was about the second time uh, we used models and but we hung them on the wall, as you see, um, in a sense to kind of make pictures. And we used the basic forms of architecture, the square, the circle and the triangle. So we, we realized that um, we could find plans of very different buildings. I mean, here we're looking at uh, Villa La Rotonda by Palladio in Vicenza, Bentham's Panopticon and Hans Orlein's uh, Museum of Modern Art in Frankfurt. And we realized by putting together very disparate elements um, expressed as building plans, we could create new associations and, and, a, and a kind of new narrative and also distance ourselves and gain a kind of a overview where we could talk about lots of different issues. We didn't really realize this very objectively at the time, but we were, because we were working intuitively, but we just, um, carried on working this way and developed um, our practice from then on. This is a work called Maison de Force, and here there are seven chairs with the plans of seven prisons in their seats. And we light them from above so that the plans almost become like the way we're imprinted with buildings as we use them. These are the buildings of the European Union. And these are, these are key modernist buildings in London. This is- Ivrea, in the Olivetti complex. This is Ivrea, the Olivetti complex, the town near Turin in Northern Italy that Olivetti, uh, commissioned some of the most progressive Italian architects over the course of the 20th century to design buildings for all the functions of the company and all the needs of the employees. So in the top left-hand corner, you have building one, the main administration headquarters building. And below it, you have the social welfare building with an art gallery. And then as you progress uh, from left to right, there are there's housing for workers and their family, housing for managers, a theater, another office building, housing for singles and couples, research and development offices, technical design offices, and the restaurant for everybody living on the site. So this is kind of corporate utopia in a sense. And we've met people there who actually lived there and worked there, and some of them hated it and some of them loved it. I mean, all your needs are catered for there, you could almost sort of live and die on site. This is a work called Negotiating Table that we made for an exhibition at the Chateau of Chambord. And we were intrigued by this elliptical form which we based on the IMF table in Paris. And we liked the fact that it was open at one end. And we always wondered why it was open at one end. And then we discovered it was open to let the 
tea lady in to give the delegates their tea during the conference? We made these works in the run up to the first Gulf War. So furniture in rooms and spaces, of course, um, is a key um, indicator of how the spaces are used and the relationships between people. This is um, a series of works called, we called Logo Works, and these are corporate headquarters buildings of big commercial companies and banks in Germany in 1990. We um, were making an exhibition in Frankfurt and we were intrigued by these buildings. Um, and we made the series of works where we took the plans. We noticed a very logo centric notion of the plan. And we decided to emphasize that in these works and turn them into these kind of heraldic signs. So they range from the Messeturm in Frankfurt, BMW in Munich, Deutsche Bank, which is nicknamed Credit and Debit, um, Unilever, IBM, Rank Xerox, the Hesher Landes Bank, and the DG Bank in Frankfurt. So change of theme here, this is um, Millbank Penitentiary, which is the prison that used to stand in London on the site where Tate Britain now stands today. And we were intrigued by the, by the plan, this beautiful flower with petals radiating out. And in the center, it, is, it has a chapel and each petal has different kinds of prisoners, male, female, debtors. There's, there were many types of prisoners Murderous held there. thieves and uh, mad people. So this was demolished and uh, Tate Britain was built on the same site. And in fact, the prisoners from Milbank Penitentiary were shipped to Australia. Yeah, it was a key point of embarkation for convicts uh, going, being sent to Australia, transported. So in, in around 1990, 91, um, uh, in, in London, our studio is next door to the East London Mosque. And we noticed a complete change in the atmosphere sort of on the street in the community with the kind of emergence of um, identity politics, religious politics, religious identity. And, um, we, we've since understood that there were key factors in this. Um, the end of the Soviet Union, the realignment, political alignment of geopolitically of people's identities, um, and events even like the publishing of the Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie and it being exploited as a kind of identity signifier. Uh, and so we started to make um, intuitively, we just started to make sculptures of religious buildings because we felt that they um, were such key signifiers of community identity. And this is the mosque of Ibn Tulun al Qatai in, in Cairo. And we went on to make sculptures of the churches, like this is Van, Dom van der Lans Valskirk, the uh, church of the Abbey of St. Benedictus of Vals in Holland. And we combined them in different ways, also with synagogues. And here is the Kaaba in Mecca. And on the left there is Philip Johnson's synagogue in Port Chester, New York. And this is the Mosque of Al-Hakim in Cairo. This is a, a modernist, um, social housing development uh, outside Paris, on the outskirts of Paris, by Emile Ayot, and uh, called Les Coutiliers. And there, we made a series of works, and we've, which is ongoing, uh, looking at key modernist uh, and social architecture, and, and the way it's represented in images. This is the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, and this is the Bauhaus. 
This is the uh, Ministry of Health and Education by Oscar Niemeyer in Rio de Janeiro. And we made this drawing from a photograph of the facade. And we turned it into a carpet, which we then displayed on the wall or on the floor. Here it's on exhibition at Moin Sartu um, with Bridget Riley. These are the air routes of the world, day and night. We've worked a lot with aviation and systems. So we, when we were making the works about um, the architecture of the European Union in the late eighties, um, we, we started uh, looking at airport and aviation architecture um, as a, in a way as a key signif signification of globalization, which was intensifying at the time international communication and uh, geopolitical developments. Um, and also envisaging um, these motifs drawn from the aviation world as a kind of architecture of the skies, if you like, a, a more sort of abstracted architecture of movement and order and arrangement. And so we were looking at the air routes um, internationally. This is um, globe table. Globe table, and the globe can be rotated in any direction. It's not on the single north-south axis. And we started looking also at the three-letter codes, which signify cities and airports around the world. And I think as the world gets more and more complicated and systems multiply, we have more and more need to make abbreviations and to make things more concise. This is the mind zone with Zaha Hadid. Uh, change of theme and approach again. This is the work that Alan was talking about earlier on the Isle of Butte. It's an installation we made in the Burgess Chapel at Mount Stewart. And the third Marquis of Butte um, converted to Catholicism and he was a very idealistic man um, in a very religious manner. And he, in a sense, he had he, his personal mission to recreate Jerusalem on the island of Butte. Uh, it's a very kind of religious utopian uh, notion. And here we, we connected um, the Isle of Butte and this notion of Palestine with uh, the modern world, and we made this wall painting in the visitor center, which combines the code signifiers for Rothsay, the, the town on the Isle of Butte, with Jerusalem, and those for Glasgow and Tel Aviv on the right. The Marquis of Butte made several journeys to Palestine, which obviously in the mid 19th century was quite an arduous undertaking. This is a work called uh, Language of Places, Beijing. And here we have the three letter aviation codes again, combined um, internationally, combined with those just for China. China has the fastest expanding aviation network in the world. And these wall paintings are derived from computer animations we make where the three letter codes um, dissolve, dissolve in and out of each other. And here is Heathrow Terminal 5. And this is a digitally controlled neon work. So having embarked on this um, exploration of the world of codes and signifiers, of course, we very quickly uh, notice that um, these exist in the art world too, and we use these abbreviated museum names as a kind of common linguistic currency. Um, MoMA, SMAK in uh, Ghent, and but probably MoMA in New York is, the mo is obviously the best known one, or even just maybe the VNA in London might be the oldest, we don't know. But um, of course, there are hundreds of them now, and they're all over the world. And they're a kind of poetry of art and place and travel in a sense. Art, money and travel perhaps. Now, 
This is um, a sculpture called Eclipse. Um, it's at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. And it has, we, we'd spent sort of 20 years making sculptures that resemble furniture and telling people they couldn't sit on them or touch them or dine off them. And then when we made this work, uh, we made it to be used as well as contemplated. So it's a conference structure, a seminar structure for about 40 people. And in its elliptical mode, everybody can sit together. Um, they have equal access to each other and they can have a conversation or a seminar or a conference. But um, the, benches, the benches can be disassembled and rearranged to make a small auditorium where people can listen to a single speaker or watch a film. Here it is at Petworth House in West Sussex. This is um, a work called Opening Capture at the Yale Center for British Art. And again, it has two modes. It has a duality. It has an extrovert mode where you're looking out at your surroundings joined by an introvert mode where you're having a more intimate conversation with your companions. companions. And this is an outdoor version in Portland Stone at Euston in London. And this is a smaller version of Eclipse at Belsay Hall in Northumberland. So in 2004, we completed this work, which is a glass and steel pedestrian bridge uh, linking Paddington Station in uh, central West London with the new Paddington Waterside development. And we were inspired by Japanese shoji screens, the translucency of the screen as we wanted to make a kind of filter for a changing environment, which at the time was um, full of rather ugly post-war industrial and um, sort of business buildings, but the area is being redeveloped and uh, turned into kind of office retail utopia. And um, we, we made this bridge where with the space over the water, so that you would have somewhere to stop and contemplate and look at the basin and also performances could take place there. Also, I mean, going back to that work, it was almost like a Japanese shoji screen. Oh, I still doubt it. Yeah. This is a work we made. Well, it's, well, it's a marble sculpture. A marble sculpture. There's another marble sculpture um, at the University campus at Suffolk and Ipswich. This is a work called um, Infinite Loop. This is GCHQ, the UK government communications headquarters. And this is Google. And looking at uh, GCHQ, the UK government communications headquarters, led us to think about the age of, sort of super surveillance. And so we went on to make a series of works called internet giants, masters of the universe, and a, an exhibition with um, Jonathan Watkins, the, the director of Icon Gallery in Birmingham, where we made sculptures about the new architecture of the internet giants. This work actually was probably the largest model we've ever made, and it's actually embedded in the wall. So these are the headquarters buildings of internet giants. They're mainly obviously in California and also in China. This is Facebook you're facing. This, this is, is Frank Gehry's Facebook. Which building. is the largest open plan office of in, the world. in the world. And you can drive around it on micro scooters, it's so vast. This is Suning in Hangzhou in China. And this is Baidu, the Chinese Google in Beijing. This is IBM's Beijing headquarters. This is Alibaba, the e-commerce and banking. This is Apple at Cupertino. This is NVIDIA in Santa Clara. Here we downloaded all the plans from the internet to make the models. This is Apple in Sunnyvale. So we were, of, of the Western internet giants, mainly in America, we were able to, as Nikki says, download the plans from the internet from, because they have to apply for planning permission to the towns where they build these buildings. But obviously in China, it's not possible to do that. So we worked either with Google Earth 
or from renders produced in publicity material. So we work a lot by hand and by eye. This is Norman Foster's Apple Park it's for Apple at Cupertino. And this is a verbatim quote from Steve Jobs. Um, so we also, we, we looked at the um, utterances, quotes from uh, the people, the CEOs of these companies. And this is the odd one out. This is Jimmy Wales who founded Wikipedia. This is Mark Zuckerberg. I'm trying to make the world a more open place. This is uh, an installation that we made in 2016 at Piccadilly Circus in London. It's a memorial in honor of Frank Pick, who was the first managing director and CEO of London Transport. And he's the man who was, who's responsible for the design strategies of London Transport. And he commissioned Harry Beck to make um, the underground map of London, which is you know, known throughout the world, a beautiful map of London. And he also commissioned Charles Holden to design over 50 underground stations. And that, bus garages and other infrastructure. And the Edward Johnson typeface, which is still, using, still in use today, is uh, used in, in this work. So he also um, commissioned that from Edward Johnson is considered by many people to be the first uh, modern typeface. Um, so these words, um, we actually, when we were researching the project, we were going through the London Transport Archive and we were looking at Pick's lecture notes. And in 1917, he gave a lecture about the importance of good design and the influence it could have on the quality of life for everybody in society, not just the wealthy. Pick believed that everybody in society was entitled to live in a beautiful environment that made sense, and worked well. And in his typed out lecture notes, scribbled in pencil in the margin, was this little equation, beauty, immortality, utility, perfection, goodness, righteousness, truth, wisdom the attributes on the left in his mind leading to those on the right in the right column so it's a little like a little philosophical equation if you like anyway we loved it and we thought this was the essence of his thinking and we wanted we wanted because he adopted the roundels the logo we wanted him to have his own logo because he was a very underrated unappreciated man who worked himself to death he was actually sacked by Winston Churchill. <laughs> um, it's quite an interesting story because he was recognized as a great administrator. And so Churchill wanted him to help in the war effort at the outbreak of the Second World War and got him to start organizing propaganda, anti-German, anti-Nazi propaganda. And he refused to, he said, a lot of this is lies, it's not true. I refuse to do it. And so Churchill sacked him basically. So this is um, Sir John's Soane Museum here. And in the library dining room at the museum um, is this row of um, 18th century chairs, which Soane uh, were made in China and Soane purchased them for, his, for their aesthetic value. He never used them, he just kept them as objects of beauty. So this inspired us to make our own row of chairs and the chairs contain models, it's called Grand Tour, of the buildings that Soane would have visited and might have visited if, or he, did. Was, might have visited if he was going back to, to do a tour today. Yeah. So in, in 1780, 82, Soane as a young man, um, he, he was at the Royal Academy in London. He, Soane was the son of a bricklayer, so unlike most of his contemporaries as architects who were generally aristocratic. Soan came from very humble beginnings, but he was a very, very clever man. And he won the gold medal at the Royal Academy as a student. And this allowed him to go on the grand tour across Europe um, to 
um, learn about the great um, monuments of um, historic architecture in Europe. And he traveled right across Europe from Brussels down to Greece, from London via Brussels to Greece. He traveled over Germany, France, Italy, and he recorded the buildings he went to. This is Villa, Cap uh, Villa Farnese, Caprarola in Italy. And he went to many others. So th this sculpture, the seven chairs, show buildings that we know he visited or which we uh, propose he might visit he was, if he was making the same tour today. This is the Basel Art Museum extension by Christ Gan Gantenbein. The backs of the chairs show one of his favorite motifs as well, which is this starfish design, which he also adopted on the shallow domes in the Soane Museum and in other buildings at Pitsanger Manor as well. Yeah. And this is a model of the a maquette of the chairs. And this is the motive itself that inspired us. And this is our globe table in the breakfast room. And this is a very beautiful pivotal room that leads you in all directions throughout the house. So it's at the heart of the Stone Museum and the museum almost sort of rotates around this room. It's one of the most clever subtle interiors uh, in London without any doubt. And as well as this shallow uh, dome, it also has all of these uh, mirrors fitted into the room. And so it's also a room of surveillance, um, aesthetic intensity and surveillance. And it also contains a kind of memorial to Napoleon. And so it's also a kind of conjecture on the geopolitics of the day. And Napoleon, like Stone, was um, a man of very humble origins who rose to great heights. So um, it's often considered that um, Stone admired Napoleon and um, was inspired by him. So, yeah. so this is the work curator's signatures. So we, this is quite a shift uh, here, but um, when we designed and built a new studio for ourselves, we had to move our own archive. And a bit like when you take up a lino, an old carpet and start reading the newspapers that were laid under it 20, 30, 40, 50 years before, um, we were moving our archive and we started looking at the letters over the 40 years of um, our career. And we noticed the signatures of the curators who we'd corresponded with. And they were very, very beautiful. And they seemed to say a lot about the time and also the way the curator has now become increasingly professionalized um, in the context of art and design and um, life generally. So we decided to treat the signatures as aesthetic objects, as a kind of calligraphy, if you like, and we made this exhibition in, in Japan, in Japan, a year, just over a year ago. CTA Kitakyushu, just over a year ago. There's over 120 signatures. Some are very abstract, some are recognisable, um, but they're very beautiful. So that's um, Hans Ulrich Obrist on the left, and his um, mentor in a way, Harold Seaman on the right. I mean, the signature is a code for the individual personality at the point where they become public. And increasingly, you know, we're not using our own authorship to sign things, you know, as communications change and become electronic. So, um... In 2018, we were invited to go to Ghana to research um, a particular architectural legacy unique to Ghana, which is um, the architecture of the slave forts on the Ghanaian coast. This is uh, Elmina Castle, which was built by the Portuguese in 1482. And it's the, it's the earliest European built structure uh, south of the Sahara in Africa. Um, it was built by the Portuguese, which is subsequently um, 
in the 1600s, it was captured by the Dutch, and later in the 19th century, it was ceded to the English. It's, today, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but it's the largest of the slave forts. And very close to Almina is this fort, which is Cape Coast, which was built by the Swedes, later captured by the Danes, and then by the English. And these are some of the plans. We researched for over three years, um, sometimes in Legon University, in Accra and Ghana, in Holland, and in the UK, to find the plans. There, there were over 50 forts built um, from between 1482 and the mid 19th century. And uh, about 20 remain today. Some is just ruins or a few stones on the beach. And some like Elmina and Cape Coast are huge edifices and maintained in relatively good condition today. You can visit them. This is Baba Osaka, who was one of our collaborators in Ghana. So we decided to work with um, some local Ghanaian artisans in making the artworks for the exhibition. And there's a culture of flag make making in the coastal region of Ghana since the 17th century. And um, it's a very vibrant culture and it's used to communicate um, and boast between different communities. And the flags are made for festivals and um, uh, they have very lively performances. Um, so we decided to work with the master flag maker, Baba Isaka, to make some of these sculptures, which were made out of cotton of Kike. You say sculptures, they look more like paintings in a sense. So this is? This is the plan of English Fort Commander. And this is Eric Dankwa, who, um, is a wood carver at Aburi near Accra, and he helped us make a sculpture which recreated the last, the, the Dutch state chair of the last Dutch governor of Elmina Castle. So we photographed this chair in a back room at the Fort of Axine, and we took Eric the photo, we printed out one to one size, very large, and we took it to him and we said, do you think you could make, recreate this item. In three dimensions. And so he said, yes, so he did it. We then installed a, a model in the seat of the chair. This is the door of no return being made. Yeah. So all, all of these forts um, have this common point, which is the last portal through which the captives were forced before they were loaded onto ships to make the passage to the Americas where they were sold into slavery. And this is the gate from the door of no return at Elmina Castle. And we've reproduced it in mahogany with Eric's help. These are some shots of the exhibition. Let's just talk about the door. Yeah, so this is the door of no return. It's a video installation. Beyond the door is a, a dark chamber with a video of the Gulf of Guinea, the sea, playing with the audio. And the door is flanked on either side with, um, we redrew wind maps that were made by a Dutch um, map maker called Johannes van Kurlin in the 17th century. And these maps were used to navigate the coast of West Africa. They told the mariners if they reached certain points where they could pick up winds to take them to other points. They were like state secrets at the time. The door is permanently closed and um, you have to stand and look through it. And these are models of some of the forts. This is one of the earliest English forts at, at no longer stands, but it was built at Commando. You can see the tiny little fort in the center, which was built in 1633. And then as the trade expanded, they built the much larger fort around it in 1686. The frames are African redwood. 
and it's been double gilded with gold, which was the main capacity. This is, this is Fort Good Hope, which is a Dutch fort. And this is uh, work is called Palaces of Culture. The two plans at the top are the plans of Cape Coast Castle and Elmina Castle, the slave forts, the two largest forts. The other plans are of buildings in London, which were all funded in different ways by the profits of slavery, the Atlantic slave trade and the plantation economies. And it's um, gold thread on black velvet with an African redwood frame. So you have on the left, bottom left is the British Museum with the British Library at the centre. Next to it, the small plan is the Natural History Museum in London. And then on the right hand corner is the V&A and in the centre is the Tate Gallery. So this is um, Charleston Farmhouse. This is the house that the painters Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell arrived at in 1916, looking for somewhere to work uh, while the First World War was going on. Duncan Grant was a conscientious objector and to avoid being imprisoned, he had to do useful work on the land. So they found um, this house, which was very run down at the time, and um, they lived there and with their Bloomsbury group uh, friends until Duncan died in 1978. So galleries have, uh, some of the barns have been converted into galleries, although it's still a working farm. And new galleries, this one has been built. Designed by the architect. Jamie Fobert. So here's some of the works from the exhibition. This work is called African Union. So this is the uh, auditorium of the African Union in Addis Ababa. Um, we made this at the same time as we were working on the sculptures about uh, the slave trade in Ghana. And um, it was actually, um, the slave trade shows, you know, the buildings refer um, unavoidably to the truth of the Atlantic slave trade. I mean, when you stand in those buildings in Ghana, you can be in no doubt of the horror, the misery, the huge extent and the vast numbers of people who were captured, imprisoned and shipped. Um, so it speaks of centuries of European exploitation and extraction of resources from Africa. This building, the uh, African Union in Addis Ababa was designed, paid for, and built by the Chinese. So um, we may have moved on from the Atlantic slave trade, but um, there's still competition for Africa's resources. This is Surrounding Time, a work which we made in 1990. In 1990. And these are buildings of European cultural and financial institutions and punitive institutions combined with the buildings of the European Union. That's the European, the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. That's the Colosseum in Rome. That, the work there on the left, um, shows the plans of five peace halls. Um, these were cloth markets. You'll see this work again in a minute. They were cloth markets built in Yorkshire in the 18th century. Only one remains though, and that's Halifax. Yeah. And this is the work Traces of Living, which we made in 1986 for the gallery in the house in East End, but we reconfigured it um, for its exhibition at the Soane Museum and here at Charleston. And um, the, the proportions of the table are based on Soane's kitchen table. Yeah. And the chairs contain models of the National Gallery, 
in Trafalgar Square in London and the Soho Museum in Lincoln's Inn Fields in London. The basement areas. Yeah. And the objects in the table are just basically um, items that we found in the streets of Whitechapel in the early 1980s. A dried out cauliflower, a loaf of bread with a rat inside it, a tobacco leaf, a hand carved rolling pin, a dead baby bird that's fallen out of the nest. This is the Alibaba headquarters. These are the only remaining artifacts from the kitchen installation because um, the art school we went to burnt down um, in 1980, the year that we left. Um, and it, the kitchen installation was consumed in the fire, but we had these two um, items. Um, so we've kept them ever since. And we showed them with a little film that we made on Super 8 at the time. This work here is called High Point. And in the center is um, High, High Point in... This is, this is in Rea, Italy, but yes, this is High Point. Yeah. So in the centre here is High Point, the block of flats at Highgate in London, designed by Lubeckin. Bertolt Lubeckin. And it's flanked on either side by the plan of Keeling House, which is the first high-rise block of social housing built in London after the Second World War. It was designed by Dennis Lasden, and it was only when we were making the piece that we discovered that Lasden had actually worked in the Beckins office as a young man. But to us, they're both kind of express, indicate heroic periods of modernist architecture. Le Corbusier visited High Point, um, which is middle-class housing with tennis courts and swimming pools. It's very, very beautiful, it still stands today. And when he visited it, he said, this is a building of the, the first rank. And Keeling House, the blue panels, today is um, after years of decay and decline, it's been restored and it's now houses architects and designers. Mostly. Mostly. <laughs> this is Riola, the chapel by wow. Alva Alto, so outside Boulogne. Outside. Uh, Bologna, and it's part of the series of religious architecture. So we did three exhibitions at Charleston. We also did um, this exhibition, Absent Artists, um, where we uh, curated um, an exhibition from the, correct, the collection of Katrin Bellinger, who's a a German art collector and an old master drawings dealer who lives in London. And she has a collection, which you can see on Instagram um, and on the web, called The Artists at Work, with around 1,500 works of artists uh, depicting themselves at work. And within the collection is a subset of around 50 or 60 works that show the artist's studios um, by the artists, but without them present. And so we curated this exhibition from that subset, because of course the artists are absent from Charleston too. Um, Vanessa Bell having died in 1961 and Duncan Grant in 1978. So. And we created this kind of sensuous serpentine with a parabolic arch in the center that you could walk between both sides of the space and because we didn't want the space to have a sort of hierarchy and we placed um, the, the artist's tools on it. And then there were paintings, photos, lithographs, etchings mm. in all media around it. That's Lucian Freud's studio.
And this is the last installation that we made um, near heaven. We were invited to um, explore Vanessa Bell's attic studio, which was a space that she created to get away from all the humdrum of the house and the activities going on, which sort of distracted her and kept her away from her work. So she actually built and incorporated these windows at the top of the house in the attic as a kind of artistic retreat. It was a very, very small space, um, but it was a space where she could contemplate, where she could look out over the land landscape and the garden. So until very recently, this space was being used as an archive store. So it was full of metal shelves and archive boxes, which we removed. Um, but we didn't do anything else to the space apart from installing these mirrors in the eaves. And we were inspired by um, her studio mirror, which is the only artifact um, that survives from her period when she was working there. And she painted a lot of her self-portraits using this mirror. Um, on the mantelpiece are busts um, of her sister, Virginia Woolf, and on the left, her mother, Julia, Julia Stephen. Stephen. And we gathered flowers, the gardener, Harry, gathered flowers from the garden, which we replenished and put into the space yeah, every day. Every day. So the, the two busts, um, we don't believe they were there when she was there, actually. They, um, we found them there when it was being used as a store, but we just thought they could stay there. Um, they were the two women in, that she had key relationships with. Um, and um, we, we thought that um, it made sense to allow that, um, the memory also of the space's use as a store after it was her studio. Yeah. We wanted the space to really be um, an experiential space, which is why we inserted the mirrors in the eaves of the house so that you could just stand in the room and be there. We didn't want to intervene or do anything too heavy. Um, and this is our own house and studio that we designed um, on a plot. We found a piece of land in the UK, in Kent, uh, 20 years ago. And um, we'd always wanted to build um, a studio for ourselves. We, we restored old, old buildings in Whitechapel, but we wanted to build something from scratch that was contemporary, so we built this. And that's, that's, that's the so end of the... Do you uh, ask any questions or we can look at certain works again if you, if you would like. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And look, I think we'll probably just keep the format on the screen so that we can maybe flick back to some images. And it's quite amazing that as 8.13, you managed to do that in exactly an hour. <laughs> I wasn't even looking at my watch. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, I think there's probably generated lots of thoughts for us. And we look, have had the benefit of actually having a chat with you last night as well, which, um, and look, one of the things I thought might be quite interesting to kick off with, we, we talked last night about this notion of the archaeology in your work. Um, um, and I think looking at the retrospective, it's quite amazing, really, to look at the consistency over that 44 year period or whatever it is. Um, and it's amazing to think, I mean, it, you know, you skipped through fairly quickly um, the masters of the universe, the, the Google HQ and Facebook and everything else. But yeah, it's interesting when you see the work you were doing in the early 90s on the Colosseum, um, and then you see this donut shape that appears. Um, again with Foster, um, and there's something interesting I think about this notion of history and history repeating itself. And we look at the Olivetti um, complex as well. And we, I mean, as architects, we can all look at that quite nostalgically as you know a collection of really amazing looking buildings. But the work raises questions about what is it we're looking at here? Are we looking at a utopian vision or a dystopian one? And I think. That's one of the things in all of the work. You, there's this constant ambiguity between 
there's a darkness in a lot of it because of the types of buildings you're studying. Um, yeah. and darkness. But there's also, I don't know, I think there's always this question of is there freedom or is there something else going on? Um, and I don't know if that happens because you're collaborating, you're doing this together, and is there this deliberate ambiguity that appears in all the work? Um, 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 but I do, I'm curious about this kind of darkness that resonates in all of it. Um, mm. uh, I think utopia often becomes dystopia. Yeah. I mean, the thing, the thing about, you know, architecture is that, um, you know, all architecture in a way has this utopian and dystopian core. You know, we, we build um, because basically we're planning for tomorrow. We, we build to transform our lives. But of course, if building, um, it's a very expensive, time-consuming, energy-intensive, extremely demanding, complex um, activity. And so if we're going to do it, we need to do it as well as we possibly can. And we always have ambitions to improve, you know, our surroundings, the world we live in, improve um, our, our circumstances and our relationships with um, our fellow um, humans and to be adaptable so, as well to the time that we're living so in. so we need to you know do it as well as we can but at the same time as soon as we built it we become constrained by it even if we manage to do it really well which was hard enough in the first place um and yes as nikki says circumstances of course are continually changing as well so that's the reality that we face when we are, you know, when we're building. With sustainability, with global warming, with all the issues that we're facing now, we're looking at buildings in a new way. And COVID again created new juxtapositions and forced people to realize that they needed outdoor space. And there were lots of issues that now need to be reconsidered in building. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the things as well is really important to clarify is I mean you don't set out with a kind of lineage of buildings that you're about to study you suddenly I mean the house for Osama bin Laden for instance um, you know you start studying that house you then create the 3D, 3D model of it um, but it's through that process of making a model of that house that you then suddenly arrive at the HQ and understand the relationship between information technology and another building type that's connected to that house so again, yeah. that piece of work, I think, um, I mean, it might be worth getting back to that one actually, because I don't, I don't think we did talk about it too much. Um, mm. But it's like, I mean, it's what's interesting there is you start with the house for Osama bin Laden, you then mm. arrive a fairly complex institutional building, which also then raises questions about information technology and systems um, and the architecture of that, that, that information. Um, and then you can see the progression into things like Google HQ and um, um, the Gary building. So, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's quite incredible how these things that appear and reappear in your work. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the things that we're most interested in is these kind of networks of connections and links um, that join all these things in ways that are often hidden um, and sometimes deliberately concealed but other times just hidden because they're not thought about they're just not obvious at first and and i think that they do have these networks these structures these arrangements of order are can be very very beautiful they they are very beautiful even if sometimes they are very dark and i think we need to be aware of these you know we need to we need to use it to communicate we need to communicate these realities with each other um and we need to, we need to be aware of them in order to be able to make the most of them and um to use them properly if you like i mean i think in a way you know, architecture is is our kind of built consciousness I think, you know, when you put a building in place, it says a lot of, about our time, you know, economically, politically, you know, it's set in motion at the point at which it's built. One last question for me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind opening it up to everyone else, but the, the Sewn Museum, um, Degrees of Truth, the actual title for it, which I think I can, 
I mean, I can understand that. I mean, obviously, the idea of buildings as truth tellers is something you talk a lot about. And you talked about that in the context of Ghana. But in the context of Sone, is it to do with you interpreting where, is that in relation to where Sone might have gone at the Grand Tour? So some of it, some of it's factual, some of it's truth, some of it's speculative. But how far does that idea of degrees of truth extend in terms of the, the work in the terms of Sone? Sorry, that's the, uh, that's the sorry, just that's the... Um, yeah, so I've stopped it at that stopped point. Stopped it at that point. Yeah. So um, maybe, sorry, maybe we're just maybe explaining this for everyone's benefit because that that's the model of um, Osama bin Laden's house. Yes, in Abbottabad. Yeah. This is this is the last house that um, he lived in, where he he was killed uh, by the Obama administration. Yeah. It's not the the first house, which is. Um, or the earlier house, rather, which we used um, in the work that we made, the house of Osama bin Laden. But when bin Laden, as I mentioned to Alan, you know, when bin Laden was killed, um, we felt a sort of duty to record um, the events. So we made a model of the house where he was killed. And then we were looking for, um, we thought, you know, should we combine this this model, and if so, what would we combine it with? And then we were asked by a museum in Germany to contribute work for an exhibition about uh, the architectural model in art. What models can do. And um, we decided to make this work. So we realized that Bin Laden had probably been um, found through his communications. And um, we, um, we realized that the UK uh, communications surveillance headquarters at Cheltenham GCHQ would have had a role in this. So we made a model of the building, which is on the left. Uh, it was designed by Gensler, and it's known locally as the Donut. And then looking at circular buildings, uh, we quickly discovered Foster's Apple Building, um, which at the time was still under construction in Cupertino. And um, we realized that in a way, you know, we're in a new world of electronic communications where everything uh, can be observed and recorded in a different way. And of course, when we discovered the, the Apple Park being built at Cupertino, we also noticed that other internet giants were also building huge, iconic new headquarters buildings. And we thought, well, in a way, this is the architectural expression of this moment in time, a bit in the way perhaps that, you know, the Gothic cathedrals expressed the Middle Ages, or certainly today, they convey that to us. The railway stations and factories express the Industrial Revolution, the 19th century. The slave forts express the Atlantic slave trade. So different buildings, different series, groups of buildings express different times in social, human, and political history. And we thought maybe we're witnessing a shift at the moment into the, um, you know, with the architecture of the of ele electronic communications and digital information. And so we, that's how we started looking at those buildings. These companies, many of them are barely 20 years old. I mean, Apple and Microsoft are both an exception because they're about 40 years old. And but, also they were started in very modest, simple structures, garages and workshops at the beginning. They had a very sort of utopian aspect to them. But now, of course, these mega headquarters the buildings the have become massive and are controlling our every move. And we all have our phones, which are torches and recorders, and you know they can apply everything to our life if we need them. Whether it's the weather we can look at, or you know, communicating with you, um, it's you know had a huge effect on our on our reality. Yeah. So I mean the societies, the economies and cultures of every society on the planet is being reshaped by this you know, new electronic digital world. And so we thought in a way this architecture is an objective expression of, of that world. And that's why we wanted to record it. And of course, they're now commissioning the biggest star architects in the world to design the buildings themselves. Can I ask, when we're looking at the image in front of us, um, what, are we looking at a 
can you explain the materiality? Are we looking at photographs yeah. of models or are we looking at models? No, they are, are, they models. are models. They're two and, and so a half dimensions. So what you're looking at are three cabinets, which are um, uh, about, I think they're 80, 90 centimeters square and they're about um, eight or nine centimeters deep. And the models are essentially um, shallow axonometric models, which are mounted to float in the space within the cabinet. Only and we make them all by hand as well, with by a sculpt. Hand. They make them all. Yes, by hand. Yeah. And they have many, many layers of paint to bring out the beauty yeah. of the structure. I mean, 90% of what you've been looking at are, are handmade models. We don't think that 3D models have the same kind of sensitivity yet. They, they're not, they have a kind of plasticity. 3, 3D, uh, they're made yeah. out of? Sorry? Made out of what? Cardboard made, timber? They're, they're made out of card, card and wood, wood and paint, foam. Foam. Right. Very simple materials. Fantastic. I hope incredible. Yeah. 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 Can, can I ask another question about the uh, slave fort exhibition? Where, yes. where, where was that held? And it was, was held at Gallery in 1957 in Accra in Ghana. All right. So it was in Ghana. Fantastic. I was, going to, ask, I, I was going to ask the question who would be brave enough to, to show that work in Britain at the moment? <laughs> Which gallery? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. I think it's a very sensitive question because we're looking at a shared I mean, history. I mean, the, and the thing is that um, at the moment, um, there's been obviously a very positive change, which shift that we're aware of, which is that artists from Africa and the African diaspora are now being invited to show their work much more frequently and they're becoming much more prominent. And the, if you like, the art scene in all its complexity is becoming much, very enriched by this um, increase in exposure and the inclusion of these artists who've been excluded for so long. And I think the Black Lives so, Matter movement uh, helped gave, enormously. Gave that a, a, a good sort of kick. Um, but we were researching this before Black Lives Matter, and we haven't been able to show this body of work in Europe yet. But funnily enough, we have been invited just now to show the Door of No Return installation at the end of October in the San Telmo Museum in San Sebastian. So that's Spain. the beginning um, of showing it in Europe for the first time. So we, we are, we would like to find an institution in Britain or another European country that would show this work. But at the moment, they, they don't feel able to show white artists who comment on this history. They want to show generally, as in our experience, black artists who comment on this history. So, but I, I'm sure this situation will change and you know, nothing stays. Nothing stays the fixed. same, but uh, we hope the best. Can I ask about the chair, which is a is a recurrent motif in your practice for such a long time. Often people talk about the chair as some kind of a stand-in for the human subject. Yeah. I'm interested to know, is, is that a way that you feel that you're sort of putting the human in opposition with these with these models that are about kind of building systems and societal systems? Or what's the what are you playing with there? I, we're not putting them in opposition, I don't think. I th think we're, we're including the human um, by making works at human scale, which are, you know, when you see them, you can't help but, you know, feel... Relate to them. Relate to them, exactly. On a human scale. And I think furniture mediates between the body and the building. And when you look at a room and see the furniture in it, it says a lot about the use of that room. For instance, we can see you sitting around that table in conference mode, looking at us, and that room is being used for that purpose. Yeah, and even if you were all to kind of walk out now, the 
um, the way the tables and chairs are arranged in the room would tell anybody who came along in five minutes exactly what had been happening there. What had five been going minutes on, earlier. exactly. So I think, yes, I think furniture is a fundamental part of a space and a room and the relationships as humans we have with each other. Do you mind me just reading out a quote from Diane Suchik around this? No, uh, please do. Mind. Yeah. I think it's quite interesting because he said that Suchik suggests that what the chair once was to designers, the individual house is to an architect. He said, both of them represent a type with the potential to crystallize a complex range of creative ideas into a single compelling form. But he goes on to say the house can be a manifesto. It can be a benchmark or a calling card. And he suggests that the house is closer to a poem in which every line counts than it is to the baggy novel of a museum. Now, <laughs> Would you perceive a museum to be a baggy novel? <laughs> <laughs> Some, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very interesting quote. I think I think he's um, I think he's right. There, I think yeah. he's right. Yes. I mean, we've it's, as you saw early on in the sequence. You know, we've often, um, you know, we've made these conversation seats, dual seats, um, interlocking chairs. Um, so Partly because there's two of us yes. and we have a relationship which goes back a long time and it expresses, you know, who we are and our, our relationship as well, in a sense. And in the way they embody um, our relationship in the sense that we are, we're looking for a kind of balance between us. And I think that this continues in, in the other works, which are larger, like you saw the, the seminar structure bench at the Henry Moore Institute, Eclipse, which can be taken apart and rearranged between conference and auditorium modes, or the opening capture um, benches at the Yale Center for British Art. So I think this kind of bipolar um, dynamic is, is always been present in our work, even from the kitchen right at the beginning, it re reoccurs. And I think it's a kind of um, desire to, to balance, to find a kind of equilibrium and a kind of ideal way forward that respects both parts of the collaboration of the partnership. And I think that comes from us, obviously, it's very, very personal, but I think it actually extends in our way of thinking about society and, you know, our wider concerns. It's a kind of, it's a kind of macro concern as well as a micro concern. Yeah. I think we're very interested sometimes as well in exploring older structures as well as new ones. We don't always work with white walls. You know, sometimes we're invited to to do something completely new in a historic space, for instance, or you know, how do you use an older structure which is already in a particular mode and how can you intervene in that structure without imposing on it, but also setting up new equations and new questions and relationships? Just on that, um, I mean, if you consider art, the production of art in a gallery context is for an audience. So you're thinking about an audience. A bridge is a completely different situation because there's a client in some respects and, it's a, and there's a publicness to it. Did you find that transition moving from producing work for a gallery context to moving into something like a bridge structure? I mean, what was that transition like? Mm. What was that? I, we, I found it, we found it quite natural, really. Um, that relationship. Obviously. I would say it's a very good question, which is for us, um, in some ways, you know, we don't know the whole answer to it. We just do it. We're know. quite intuitive in the way we work and we like to be challenged. Yeah. We know that um, by accepting challenges, even if we don't know the outcome, you know, how we can resolve them, we know that they can put us in a new place and that new things can come from them. So um you know that that's very important to us but yes, i we, think we don't know the answers to some very good questions always about our work we just do it and we've always taken the attitude that 
um, even sometimes with the models, you know, some of them are very complex and some of them are very demanding to make. And it can be quite intimidating to start on something like that. But the important thing is to start. And when you, once you start, things begin to move into place and then we proceed from there. I mean, I think as artists, we're very conscious that we don't want to be in one particular box. You know, we love moving between things. We love moving between art, design, architecture, old, new. Um, we, you know, those things keep us alive. Those things, you know, make us tick, you know, so, you know, that's very important to us. I would be bored stiff just in one mode, just being a painter or just being, a you know, maker. a model maker or just being one thing. And I think because there's two of us and we're very different people, we can amplify those differences. I'm very conscious we've crept over the 830 mark, but given I've waited 18 years to have a conversation with you. Um, <laughs> it's, well, it's a very nice conversation to have. Oh, so you can just start wandering out of the room, I don't care. Um, uh, so I'm just going to try and squeeze in another question. Um, and we, we touched on last night the kind of future of the museum. We talked about this, I, and we had a, we, there was a lecture last week about the archive and mm. archival practice and about the museum. And we talked about the VA, um, the new, you know, 90% of the collections yeah. on show. Yeah. Yeah. So this idea of coming full circle back to the Wunder camera. But that's not the question because we talked about that last night. My question would be and it might be a strange one given that you have just built a house. But if there was a Langlands and Bell House Museum, um, what would it look like? Um, <laughs> who, would, who would be the architect? Would you have an architect? Well, we didn't have an architect. We, we, we are the architects, but we're not trained architects. We're, you know, but, you know, we're trespassers. We're trespassers, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what would it look like? I mean, is it, is it the house that we... Uh, untitled or is it some you know if, if there was no well, in a way you know untitled it could start, it with, could untitled. start with untitled I mean you know we revert from making work in it to it just being a house it can be one thing or the other it's not one thing you see yeah we, from, we don't separate our really our lives and our art making activity you know it's 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 a continuum, it's a continuum. Alan, can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I love the exhibit, the collection of the artist spaces that you curated. And uh, I, I was wondering, has anyone taken images of you and your workplace to exhibit? <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes there are photos taken of us in our workplace, but... Um, do you mean objects or things from it? What would you... Well, well, both, because, I mean, you curated that exhibition with um, what seemed to me a very great fondness for the artist's workspace. Um, and yet we'd ha we'd, we haven't seen any images of your own, <laughs> of your own workplace. And I think it would be in another dimension. Anyway, it's just, just a thought. Thank you, thank you. Yes, well, maybe we'll have a think about that in the <laughs> future. Rendition, yeah. rendition. We, we, we do have an archive of images of, of our own workplaces. So we do regularly, not in a very systematic way, but we do regularly take photos of our studio when we're working on different projects, you know. So we have, we have photos of our studio full of the work for Ghana or full of the internet giants or, full of um, the early works, you know, so th there are there are quite a number of images of, of our workplaces, yeah. Mm. I think, you know, we, we wanted to be in this sense a bit more detached. I think that's also true, yes, that it's not something we particularly, um, you know... Felt that we needed to be present to, to, in to ourselves this way, yeah. in sure. this particular instance, yeah. This might be a very unfair question, but given that wealth of curators that you've engaged with over your career, is there a standout? And we can we can turn off the recording at this point if you want. <laughs> <laughs> there are many standouts. There's I'm many sure standouts. I'm sure it depends on the I, context, but yeah. Well, um, I think you know, but each experience is different, and you know, art again, like we and emphasize, it is about relationships. 
And if you get on and have a good relationship with a curator, I think it really helps you with your work. You know, it can catapult you into new ways of looking at things and the conversations can be very meaningful and can become great friendships, you know, which is another thing, you know, we're being asked by people we've worked 20, 30 years ago to suddenly do another exhibition, for instance. And that's wonderful when you've had that relationship at the beginning point and you can return and still connect. But also, you know, sometimes art dealers also, you can have very, you know, super relationships with that can trigger new developments in, in one's work. Um, dealers and curators are different, although sometimes the, the roles obviously overlap. And we've worked with some dealers who are brilliant curators um, and, you know, and some curators who are very good at, you know, um, a business. <laughs> and some curators want to be artists or were artists before becoming curators, you know, so there's a fluidity and nothing stays the same. So things move on as well and things change. And I think you have to be able to adapt to the changes. Okay, well, look, I've got five more pages of questions, but I'll, I'll wait till I come to visit you. <laughs> well, we look forward You're to very it, Alan. Well. <laughs> yeah, very nice going, to meet everyone. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to take you up on that proposition. So, um, look, I just want to say on behalf of all of us here at the School of Design, it's been um, a pleasure to get to talk to you um, and to, for you to share your work over a, an incredible um, career. And um, I really hope the students now take a keen interest in this and seek out your work if they ever travel now that we can travel again. Um, and who knows, it would be great to see you over in Australia at some point in the in the future. I know you've never been. Um, it'd be We've great to come to Australia. And we would love to visit, would love to visit it one day. Yeah. So yeah. congratulations okay, on all the work. Ideas of Utopia look, look like a, an incredible exhibition. Um, and um, thank you once again. Brilliant. Well, thank you for inviting us. Yeah. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs> thank you from London. <laughs> I'll be in touch via email. Fantastic. Okay. 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 Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night.